this presentation is going to take uh, right around 30 minutes, maybe a little more, a little less, depending on the number of questions that we get. So our goals today are getting a basic understanding of infant brain anatomy and growth and the impact parenting has on infant brain development. I think you're going to be surprised with some of this information. Basically, what's important to know is baby brains, young brains, children's brains, we're not talking zombie brains, uh, but children's brains are like sponges. Scientific research proves that. What we do with our newborns can result in a larger vocabulary, a more developed social and emotional skill set, and even a more successful financial future for our children when they grow up. Healthy interactions between a child and his or her environment is essential to developing these strong communication skills that will last a lifetime. Babies are born with most of the brain cells they will have in their lives. What is missing are the connections between those brain cells. A baby forms 70 new connections per second in the first years of life. The speed, quality, and quantity of this growth is not automatic. It occurs in response to the baby's early learning environment. Things like talking, reading, singing, playing, cuddling. They're not only fun, but they're also the types of activities that help build those connections and have lifelong impact. Health, oh, there we go. Healthy infant brain development is built on those really small moments that parents and caregivers experience as they interact with their children. You know, think about some recent interactions either you were part of or that you witnessed with an adult and a child together. Gazing into each other's eyes and having a baby recognize the adult caregiver and be happy about it. Uh, adult and child snuggling while reading to them. Singing a child to sleep. A baby holding on to an adult's finger. These everyday moments, these simple loving encounters, provide the essential nourishment that's needed to foster healthy brain development and growth. So what do we know about brain development? As scientists learn more about how the human brain develops, many of our ideas about the brain are being challenged. We are learning that some of our old ideas were actually myths. We're replacing these old ideas and myths with new facts and new understanding. Let's play a little true-false to challenge what we know now from what we used to know. So first one, at birth, the brain is fully developed just like one's stomach or heart. I'll give you a moment. OK, you guys listen to the first couple slides. That is false. Most of the brain cells are formed at birth, but most of the connections between them um, are made in infancy and childhood. And this particular uh, diagram, you can see a newborn has very, very few connections. Those are the vital connections uh, to allow them to eat, sleep, poop, pee, you know, have a heartbeat, breathe, those sorts of things. By one month, they start to have more connections. By three months, by six months, by 15 months, that last column is 24 months. That gives you an idea of how many new brain connections are being made during this critical infancy period. OK, our next question. The brain's development depends entirely upon the genes with which one is born. I'll give you a second. Ooh, we're about 50-50 on that one. The correct answer is false. The brain's development is part nature and part nurture. Early experiences and interactions with their world are critical in a child's brain development. In the past, some scientists thought brain development was genetic and growth followed a biologically predetermined path. In other words, your future is determined by how your brain was born. Well, now we know that that's not true. We know that early experiences, even in infancy, impact brain development and influence the pathways and how the brain becomes wired for future learning and living. This is especially important concept when you're dealing with children who are born with physical uh, issues, say uh, Down syndrome or some other problem, because with early intervention you can sort of help them rewire and sort of skip around the parts of the brain that aren't functioning as well and use other parts to do the same thing. Genes provide the blueprint but a child's environment and experience carry out the construction. Pretty cool, huh? 
Next one. Since a baby can't understand what you're saying, talking to a baby isn't that important. Not only a few of you got this right. This is a false statement. It's not so much what you are saying, it's how you're saying it and taking the time to say it that's important. Talking, singing, reading to children is one of the most important things adults can do to help them grow. Learning is easiest in those first few years of life and talking to infants and young children establishes the foundation for all other learning. New studies have shown the number of words heard in the first years of a child's life impacts their ability to learn later. Many of these differences um, that we find in educational success in the world that we attribute to having to do with financial uh, levels in society, it's not really the financial level, but it can be attributed to the number of words a child hears during their critical development period. A study uh, by researchers, Hart and Risley in 1995, found that some children heard 30 million more words by their fourth birthday than others. These children who heard more words were better prepared when they entered school. These same children, when followed into third grade, had bigger vocabularies, were stronger readers, and got higher test scores. This disparity in learning, this difference in learning, is known as the achievement gap. In professional families, children hear around 11 million words per year. Children in working class families hear about 6 million words. And children in families receiving public assistance um, in this study heard 3 million words a year. Oh, what of my babies in daycare? I got a question. What of my babies in daycare? Will he or she get the vital interaction they need? for adequate brain development? Of course they will. Um, if you are using a daycare that actually interacts with the children, um, talks with them, reads them stories, plays with them, those are the things your baby needs for healthy brain development. Um, the uh, news stories you see of, say, orphanages in some other countries where children are left to just be and not have interaction, those are the things that sort of ignoring uh, process, that's part of what hinders their development. Oh, and you should know that talking, singing, and reading to a child in the same room face-to-face -face, triggers different types of brain development than if they heard the words on the television or if they heard the words on radio. Um, in person is an active activity where it actually triggers brain development. The uh, Doing it on a screen like a television or um, a computer screen um, triggers a more passive part of the brain and does not necessarily um, always improve brain development. So here at Loveless, uh, we have a wonderful storybook that we give all our families who deliver um, here, and it's called The Story of You. It was created at Loveless Women's Hospital, and um, we have since shared it with Loveless Westside Hospital and Loveless Regional Hospital in Roswell. Um, this importance of reading face-to-face -face is one of the reasons we created The Story of You. It's a free gift to our families, um, and it's a storybook that includes photos to highlight what a child will encounter during their lives from their family to geography to animals to careers. We did this in collaboration with Mission Graduate um, and ECAP, which is the Early Childhood Accountability uh, Program. We want to help families begin reading to their babies right away. So by gifting families with a book that they can personalize with stories of their own and with their newborn's birth information, we hope to help all loveless babies get off to a great start and hear as many words as they need. Um, I have another question. Uh, does reading the same story over and over make any difference to my baby's development? Won't my baby get bored? Well, no. Kids learn through repetition. So it's not that surprising that they tend to ask for the same books over and over and over and over and over again. This is how their brains absorb the stories and the language, language patterns that the stories have. Actually, in 2011, there was a study of children's language acquisition, and they found that kids that were read the same book over and over remembered and retained the meaning of a new word in their life better than kids who read different books, so they had less repetition. 
It's likely that hearing phrasing and structure of a story um, can help your child grasp and hold on to new vocabulary. And also think about it this way. It may get a little boring for us, but think about how exciting it was for you the first time you were able to remember the words to a song, whether it's a song on the radio or a song from school. Um, it's exciting for your child to learn a book so well that he or she knows what's coming and can anticipate or even repeat and chime in with the words. This is the same way we all be, love being able to know what's coming and singing the words to a favorite song. Young children enjoy stories that are being repetitive, and it's just easier to begin to memorize. So later, you can actually do things like pause and let them say the next words in the story. It's a great way to build up their excitement. All of us learn using our senses. We have senses of sight, hearing, smell, uh, uh, taste, and touch. Um, an infant's brain is a work in progress, but they receive their information through their five senses. Um, uh, you can think about it like your tablet or your phone has a touch screen or a keyboard. That's how our computers get their information. The human brain, which is a type of computer, gets their information through one or all of these senses. Um, the outside world shapes um, our development, and our experiences help us build the connections that guide our brain into how it's going to grow. Um, so basically, all these experiences impact the architecture of the brain. So it's not just memories, it's how our brain is built and structured. Now, think about how many senses come into play when you pick up your baby to cuddle. Baby can see your face, baby can hear your voice, Baby can feel your touch. Um, baby, we didn't talk about the sense of movement, but um, baby can feel you moving. And baby can smell you, whether it's your perfume or your soap. So every single one of these senses is triggered just by cuddling and snuggling. And this, in turn, helps your baby learn. Since all early experiences have a huge impact on the architecture of the brain, I wanted to just take a short moment to show you this slide from the Wall Street Journal. If you read it from left to right, like you would a page in a book, um, you'll see the bottom of the slide is the cerebellum where it coordinates movement. It's right near the brain stem, which is part of, you know, it's where, you know, our heart knows to beat, our lungs know to breathe, those sorts of functions. Um, next up from there is what's called the occipital lobe, and it processes input from the eyes. So your eyes see, but the occipital lobe tells you what you're seeing. Um, up from there is the parietal lobe. It processes touch, ta touch taste, pain, pressure, heat, and cold. Um, frontal lobe, speech, thought, short-term memory, and storage. Uh, temporal lobe, sound signals coordinate language. Uh, people who have strokes in the temporal lobe, depending on the side of the brain, it can impact their ability to speak. Uh, but if they knew how to sing before they have that stroke, they can rewire to the other side of the brain and relearn how to speak by singing. It's pretty cool. Prefrontal cortex is planning, prioritizing, that complex decision making. So here's the important part. One of the reasons I love this slide is not only because it has all this information on it, but it's also sort of from left to right gives you the direction of order of how a baby's brain starts to develop and starts to make connections. It starts at the back. So in that first week or so when your baby's looking around, you know, at first your baby can't see very far. So you are your child's world as they see your face. Um, so that's triggering the occipital lobe. As they get a few weeks older and they start looking around more, um, they're still growing areas in that occipital lobe. The parietal lobe, when you're cuddling your baby, is starting to grow receptors in response to your touch and your smell, those sorts of things. What's really cool about this is the back half of the brain, like there's a dotted line there between the words in and the, that dotted line it sort of gives you a rough estimate. So the back of the brain is mostly about receiving information. 
and accepting information. The front of the brain, in front of that dotted line I pointed out, is more about doing something with it. So as our children is gro are growing, it's so important to recognize they get a lot of sensory input before their brains have developed enough to know what to do with the sensory input. And we're going to talk about that more later. Does my baby learn, oh, I got a question. Does my baby learn from interaction with others as well as from me, like brother, sister, grandpa, grandma? Yes, your baby learns from everybody. Since babies like repetition, the more frequent a particular caregiver works with the child, so if the grandparents are, you know, part of the sort of babysitting brigade. Uh, brothers and sisters are with your baby all the time. Aunts, uncles. It's that repetition that they like, and that includes being able to see the same familiar faces. They learn to develop a sense of trust. We're going to talk a little bit about attachment and trust and how that impacts the brain architecture a little bit later. Um, with infant brain development, I just want to touch a little bit. We have different pieces of our brain. We may call it the survival center, emotional center, and decision-making center. When you're looking at the survival center, that's pretty well developed at birth. That um, helps you digest, helps you breathe, you have a heart rate, uh, regulates your body temperature, so that's something that babies aren't good at yet, um, and those sorts of things. It responds to input from other parts of the brain. So the middle brain is more of an emotional center. Um, from birth to about age four is when that's developing. So it starts receiving and processing emotions, stress. Um, they, it starts recognizing what feels good, what doesn't feel good. Um, and because it sends signals to other parts of the brain, it also triggers hormone response to these emotions. The decision-making center starts uh, really growing quickly around ages five and six, around school age. That's where a child is uh, able to handle logic, reasoning, empathy, creativity, and get a little bit more problem solving. So what's important about recognizing this is that when your baby is born and you joke that all they do is eat, sleep, poop, and pee, that's kind of all they know how to do at first. It's going to take them a little while to grow past that. The emotional center that they're growing into older infancy, uh, toddlerhood, and preschool is all feeling all the time. So because they haven't developed the problem-solving part of their brain yet, that's part of where those tantrums come from. It's like they want it, they want it now, and they really do not understand why they can't have it now. Um, so it's really important to not take those sorts of tantrum things very personally. And you know, just recognize your child's having an emotional response, and you know, what are you going to do about that emotional response? So what all of this means is that brain development is activity dependent. Information is collected in various ways throughout infancy and childhood, and this flexibility allows for intervention to work well for those with learning challenges. I was talking about that earlier. Young brains, those of infants and children, are open to learning and outside influence. They're more vulnerable to environmental challenges and stressors, too. That means that in these early years, if your child is under a lot of physical, emotional stress or lifestyle stress, um, that there can actually be architectural changes of the brain that may need to be addressed later. Um, so basically, environmental stimulation does impact brain function. And that means interact with your baby, talk to your baby, read to your baby, sing to your baby. These are all things that have huge impact. So sort of a summary here is that the earliest messages that the brain receives have enormous impact. Early brain development is the foundation of human adaptability and resilience. But these qualities come at a price. Uh, because experience has such great potential to affect brain development, children are especially vulnerable to persistent negative influences. On the other hand, if these early years are treated as a window of opportunity for parents, caregivers, and communities to create positive early experiences, that can have a huge impact on your child's chances for achievement, success, and happiness in the future. Uh, so I have another question. 
my baby's already three. How do I help them get the same advantages? Can the brain still grow? Yes. Yes, you can. Just because the brain starts to slow down in its growth spurt around that age doesn't mean it's not still growing. The brain is growing and changing, and parts of the brain that are used a lot get more stimulation. Those are the parts of the brain that will grow. So say for a family that adopted a child that had some challenges in those early months and years. You can't necessarily undo what's already been done, but you can grow strength from where they are now. So you can start reading to them now. You can start singing to them now. You can start teaching them to play. A child that has been in a stressed environment frequently doesn't know how to play because life has been about survival. Play is a huge part of how our children learn, and it helps their brains develop and grow beyond survival mode. It's so important. So yes, there are things you can be doing now. It's the same things you would have done you know, when your baby was a newborn. At two, at three, at five, at six, you read to them, you love them, you play with them, you sing with them. And remember doing things with them in person is what makes the difference. In part two, we'll talk a little bit about what studies have shown about um, using learning apps and screen time and um, whether or not it's a good replacement for that face-to-face -face interaction um, that I think you'll find very interesting. In part two, we'll also talk a little bit about attachment and how that impacts your children's ability to grow relationships in the future. So take this through first three years, if you have your child during that time, as a window of opportunity to make sure your baby has the strongest possible foundation. That doesn't mean you can't build a new foundation later. Um, one thing to think about, studies have shown that responding to a baby's needs um, has been shown to influence the development of conscious. Positive touch affects stress, reactivity, impulse control, and empathy. Free play in nature influences social capacities and aggression, and a set of supportive caregivers beyond the mother alone predicts positive IQ and ego resilience as well as empathy. Now these are all like really fancy words, but basically it means respond to your baby. Don't let them cry it out. Give them love. Give them attention. You can't spoil them. But the more attention you give them now, the better they are able to self-regulate in the future. Um, I have one more question. Um, so, okay, so this question is, um, I had a rough childhood, a lot of violence, and I, and I do not know if I can be a good parent. How can I be a good parent if I didn't have good parents? You know what, that is a really rough question, and it's a tough question, and it's awesome that you recognize those challenges. But just, you don't have to be who you were raised to be. You can be who you were meant to be. A parent who's also a trauma survivor may have less natural capacity to cope, may have less natural capacity to problem solve when stressed, like when your kid's crying, your other kids are poking at you, um, all these competing needs. But if a parent wants, they can learn new behaviors and responses. It's just not something that comes naturally, and it may not even initially be recognized as something that needs to happen because the way they're responding is the way they've always responded. So you can get parent support you from uh, different other parents in the community, from the new parent group, from, from teams like that. You can get professional support through home visiting agencies that we'll talk about in part two. Um, and also from, say, getting some counseling. There are so many options. But most importantly, recognizing your own limitations and where you want to be different. That is huge. So we are getting ready to wind up. If you have any questions about this presentation or other uh, Loveless Health System, Loving Health seminars, webinars, etc., cetera, uh, contact us at Loveless Labor of Love. Um, you can reach us at 727-7677. We also have an email, lovelesslaboroflove at loveless.com. Don't forget that Loveless Labor of Love is, uh, was begun to support our pregnant families. Um, 
also that we do a lot with uh, prenatal and postpartum yoga, which is free to our Labor of Love moms. We have a new parent group. We have weekly parenting and pregnancy emails. During the pregnancy tour, we have a great prenatal education book called Great Expectations. Uh, moms who deliver with us have access to the book Story of You. We offer our new mom's mommy massage, a special meal or menu. We have our Loving Start prenatal education, these seminars, uh, prenatal navigation, um, just to kind of help you link up to um, the community. Um, for those of you who are watching this live, uh, shoot us an email if you need these resources. I could send them to you. Um, if you are watching this later after we post it to YouTube, you are welcome to pause, take a screenshot, whatever you need to get these resources. So we do have some upcoming webinars. We have our Infant uh, Parenting and Brain Development Part 2. Um, we are also working on adverse childhood events and resiliency. For the mama who posted a question about um, a rough childhood and how that impacted her and wanting to be a better parent. Actually, the ACE study and the resiliency studies have huge impact to why, or those of you who have adopted children who had rough starts, this, uh, these studies have great uh, implications for how and why we can make a difference, even if it's years or decades later. We, we, can, we can make a difference. So we also have... Uh, webinars, seminars coming up that aren't listed here, please go to loveless.com. Um, if you are watching this live, we do have a, a postpartum success in-person seminar coming up in June um, that you may really enjoy. It's by one of the midwives that works with us here, and loveless.com has more info. So thank you very much for taking your time to be with us today. and. Um, just be good to yourself. Take care, guys. Bye-bye.